Welcome to the Mental Archive Bootcamp Day One. This is a three-day live event. So I want you to show up today, I want you to show up tomorrow, and I want you to show up Wednesday, same time, 4 p.m. Pacific. We're going to go through different levels of the mental archive and brain priming and research and demand. And there's so much juiciness here. This is my absolute favorite topic because I believe from what I've seen over the last 10 years of selling on Etsy and teaching other people how to do the same, the mental archive is the make or break. Like it truly is the one thing that separates people who don't succeed on Etsy from people who do succeed. Like almost every single time. It is the make or break. So paying attention, taking a bunch of notes, but also knowing there's a replay. So if you're the type that you get really stressed out, if you try to watch and take notes at the same time, that's fine. Just chill out, watch. Don't, don't worry about taking the notes. You can watch the replay again. And many of you will need to watch this a couple of times to let all the information sink in. Total permission to do so. I think it's a great idea. Okay. So let's go ahead and get started. That being said, Quick little disclaimer, there are a lot of newbies here today. So I always do this little disclaimer at the beginning of all of my workshops, that being that this is called this, my company, my Etsy print on demand consulting company is called Beowulf Biz for a reason, because it is intense. My, my aim and my goal for teaching you guys how to sell on Etsy is not to show you how to create a quick $200 a month, right? I have students that are doing $200,000 in 30 days in their Etsy shop alone. This is serious business. It is intense and it takes a certain level of intensity that doesn't allow me to have any time to sugarcoat or provide fluff around things. So if I'm coming across as very intense, or very straightforward, it's because that's how I got to do things because I want to get you guys to a certain level. And the only way that we can do that is if I shoot it to you as straight as possible. So some feelings will probably be hurt. Okay. But as I always say, I'm willing to hurt your feelings if it helps you get you to where you want to go faster. Okay. And I hope you guys can appreciate that because that's how I like to be taught. I just want to get to where I want to go. I really just want to get there. So I don't want fluff. I don't want people to uh, worry about my feelings. I just want to know how it is, right? So a little rundown of what this mental archive boot camp is going to look like. Day one, which is today, is going to be an intro to the mental archive and why it's direly important, you guys, direly important to your ultimate mega seller success, okay? Day two, tomorrow, we're going to look at mental archives and the ultimate sales hack, which is trend combining. We're going to look at how mental archives and trend combining are interlinked, and how they work and how to master both of them. Day three on Wednesday, we're gonna be talking about applying your mental archive to multiple levels of your business to level the F up, okay? So a lot of people, if you have been around for a while, and I'm gonna get into the, the definition of what a mental archive is, a mental archive is in a moment, but if you are, if you've been around in my world for a little while, you'll know that mental archives, I talk about it in respect to research, but many people don't know it's also related to mock-ups, to descriptions, to your branding, your, your shop aesthetic. Literally, you're, you use a mental archive to dial in every aspect of your business. And that's we're gonna what we're going to talk about on day three, you guys. This is such powerful stuff. I know you don't realize it yet because you're probably still scratching your head going, the mental archive word is just very weird. I have no idea what's going on, but get prepared, okay? Because it's gonna blow your mind. So if you are new around here, which I said many of you are, I'm very excited to see that, but I need you to know one thing. Research and database decisions are king in terms of a seller's priorities, or they should be king in terms of a seller's priorities, right? Because ultimately demand is king. Database decisions and research should be king in terms of your priorities because mega sellers know that demand is king. It's the only thing that drives sales, demand. That's all you need to drive sales, really. There's other things that support it, but when it boils down to it, as I'm going to show you in a second with, a, with specific examples, demand is the only thing you need, which is actually really cool when you think about it. So without mastering demand, you will never, ever succeed with an Etsy shop. I want to say that one more time with more emphasis. Without mastering demand, you will never, ever succeed with an Etsy shop. I'm going to let that sink in for a second. <laughs> it's that important. So strategy and tactics always, in every case, without exception. Have I emphasized this enough? 
come after your level of expertise in demand. So the strategies and tactics that you're so desperate for that you think are going to make all of the difference, they mean almost nothing if you've got no demand expertise. Okay. So this is the example that I want to show you. This is the absolute gold standard example for showing you exactly why your perception of SEO being king, being it's everything, right? If my SEO is good, I'll make a bunch of sales. If I'm not doing well, I just got to get better SEO. That's not the truth. And this is why, okay? What you're seeing here are three examples of Etsy listings. All three of them have bestseller badges. One of them, it shows us 20 plus people have it in their cards, right? They have super high demand, and it's not that they're at a low price point. All of them are, you know, the, the shirt is 22, the, the crew neck's almost 50 bucks. And then the other crew neck's $35, right? It's, it's not that they're at a low price point. And is it their titles? Is it their SEO? No, the poop emoji there is showing us <laughs> how crappy that title is, right? Some of the, it's all good sweatshirt. Is that good SEO? Absolutely not. Embroidered aquarium TV sweatshirt. Is that good SEO? No, it's terrible. Not only is it not good, it's horrible, you guys. And guess what? They all still have bestseller badges. How could that be? People who are new to Etsy, new to my world, this is one of the main questions I get asked. They're like, Brittany, you, you're always talking about, you know, using E-Rank and having your SEO dialed in and doing this and doing that. But I see listings all the time that have bad titles and they have bestseller badges. How could that be? And it's always because of demand. If shoppers want your stuff, the Etsy algorithm is going to be your best friend and it's going to show your listing to tons of shoppers regardless of your SEO. Doesn't mean that we should throw SEO in the trash. It's a huge support beam in building your empire, but it also doesn't mean that it's everything the way that most people assume it is, right? So I hope these examples, and then you might say like, oh, pretty found the only examples on Etsy. No, there are so many, you thousands of listings like this that have really crappy SEO and bestseller badges, okay? These are just three that I found very easily immediately when I searched for it on Etsy. So in order to master demand, which now we know it's king and it is the most important thing, we have living, breathing proof of that in the last examples that I just showed you. In order to master it, you have to become an expert at it. And to become an expert at it, you have to master research, also known as what I coined the term brain priming, okay? And you have to execute designs, your mock-ups, basically all decision-making around what you know shoppers are actually actively looking for and emotionally connecting with. If you're new around here, what I just said in the last three minutes should be blowing your mind. OK, because this flies in the face of almost everything that's taught about Etsy by, you know, free, free YouTube videos or Etsy gurus or whatever. Like when people just first hop into selling on Etsy, all of their assumptions are almost directly the opposite of what I'm telling you here today. But I've got the receipts. I've got all the proof. I've got all the mega sellers under my belt that have come out of my master course top seller secret because they followed this framework. Right. So this is the truth because it's been proven and tested. Everything that I talk about, everything that I say has a foundation of data-based research. I've tested it and I've proven it over and over and over and over and over again, not only in my own shops, but in all of my students' shops as well that are now mega sellers, right? So you can trust this information. So everybody wants mega seller status on Etsy, of course, and most are even willing to do the required mega seller level work, right? But most people, almost all sellers, especially the brand new ones, they can't tolerate and accept where they are, meaning their beginner status with no or a few sales. They can't tolerate it while working towards where they want to be, which is thousands of sales, right? And if we think of this on... Another level, like say you're learning piano, a lot of people with any instrument, any sport, any skill, most people before they get to expert level will quit because they can't tolerate not being excellent at it yet. For some reason, they feel that they should just sit down at a piano and be able to play Mozart. But we know on a logical level, it doesn't work that way. Same thing goes for print on demand. Most people will quit too early because they cannot tolerate being in the beginner status. They just want the thousands of sales. They don't want to spend the time and the effort getting to the thousands of sales because it's too uncomfortable hanging around in that beginner status, right? So, but let me, I want to talk about this very fast. 
before we move deeper into the definition of a mental archive. When a baby bird is learning to fly, what must it do before it flies? Baby birds must fall. Now, when I think about this, it makes me actually really sad that this happens to so many baby birds every day, but they all learn to fly, right? But before a baby bird can learn to fly, it's in the tree, right? And the mom says, okay, it's your day. Come after me. The mom takes off. The baby bird takes off after the mom. And then it falls because it doesn't know how to fly yet, right? But then what happens? As it's falling, it learns rapidly through that fall. However, I'm sure it's horrifying. I'm sure it's uncomfortable AF. I'm sure that the baby bird wants nothing more than to not be falling. It's confused, it's disoriented, and it's just free falling away from its mom. It's gotta be one of the most uncomfortable feelings and experiences ever, right? But then it learns how to fly because it has no other option in order to save its own life, right? So this is a really dramatic example of what we call the learning curve. It's uncomfortable, it sucks, and it's 110% necessary to get you to where you wanna go, okay? The learning curve is where most people stop trying and declare themselves a failure. So if you think of a new print on demand seller as a baby bird, opening the shop, doing your first couple listings, that's your baby bird moment when you're first flying out of the tree. And guess what's going to happen? More than likely, you're going to fall, meaning you're not going to make any sales at first. First few weeks, first few months, depends how much you're executing, how well you're executing, the type of map you're following, right? Most of the time we're going to fall and we're falling into that learning curve. And at the bottom of that learning curve, or maybe even way before they hit the bottom, right? The whole time it's uncomfortable because you're disoriented, you're confused, you don't know what to do next, and you feel like you're flailing just like a little baby bird. So most people will stop trying when they feel they start to fall, when they feel the drop, when they don't get the immediate results, and they'll declare, I'm a failure, or they'll declare, this isn't for me, or they'll, they'll declare, Etsy doesn't work. Is this clicking with you guys? Is this making sense? I thought this was the perfect analogy to put side by side to what happens in the Etsy world, okay? The learning curve is intense and it has to be in order to get you to where you wanna go. Because if it was easy, you'd probably just quit because there was no challenge and it's boring, right? And if it, if it just took time and there was no challenge, most of you would be too impatient anyway. So it's a little mixture of everything. There's some challenge, there's some patience involved. There's a lot of things that happen during the learning curve. And it weeds out the people that don't really want it that bad or don't believe in themselves or haven't worked on their limiting beliefs. The, the people that learn to fly are the people who can tolerate being in the learning curve, okay? This ties into the mental archive in this way. The sellers who reach mega seller status are the ones who get comfortable in the learning curve, as I just said. They embrace and master the process and understand that their quote unquote beginner status is not a reflection of their actual competency, their actual capability, or their actual intelligence. It's just simply where they're starting out. Imagine if you sat down at a piano, you tried to play Beethoven, and after you couldn't even play Mary Had a Little Lamb, you just said, oh, I'm so stupid. I'm never going to be able to play. This is dumb. I, I quit, right? Logically, we know that's not how that works. Same thing with print on demand. Your beginner status is not a reflection of your trajectory or where you're capable of going. It's just your starting point. How many of you are feeling like this right now? I can't see the chat, but tell me in the chat, raise your hand, say me, if you're getting a light bulb moment. If your frustration since you've started this journey if it's kind of making sense now, you're understanding, oh, I was just in that falling portion of the baby bird trajectory, right? I still have the potential to fly and it can be very disorienting and frustrating at first and I can still win big, right? I want this to be a light bulb moment for you guys. So to help give you better chances of becoming a mega seller, I'm going to help you deeply understand how to leverage, understand, and appreciate the process of becoming the mega seller. It's called building a mental archive and is it is the evolution of expertise, okay? Building your mental archive is the evolution of expertise. We learned that demand is king. We learned that you have to become an expert of demand. We learned that it's gonna feel really hard at first and disorienting. And now we're learning that if we can build our mental archive and commit to the process and know what's most important, we can actually 
witness the evolution of our own expertise, which is going to get us to mega seller status, right? It's like an equation. That's how this stuff works. That's why I'm running this workshop today to help you guys understand that equation more clearly because most people don't, unfortunately. So what is a mental archive? Finally, we're getting to the actual definition. A mental archive is where all of the information is stored in your subconscious from direct observations or research, right? A large mental archive grows from doing one thing, researching, and researching a lot and consistently, right? That is the only way you can grow a mental archive from actually doing intentional research work and doing it consistently. So when you have a large mental archive because you've spent a solid amount of time developing it, decisions come effortlessly, usually without even knowing how or why. And I'm talking about when you sit down to design, when you're deciding what type of niche you wanna try next, when you're deciding what to do, what sort of moves to make, having a big mental archive allows you to have a really clear intuition. So when you have a big mental archive, your intuition is strong and you seem to quote unquote, just know what works. It looks like magic to other people, but it's not magic. It's a mental archive. That's what I should have called this workshop. <laughs> mental archive boot camp is boring. That's out. Mental archives are magic. Or no, it's not magic. It's mental archive. That's the new workshop name, guys. <laughs> We know, right? We know why it looks magical is because you put in the work to build your mental archive. I always use this example when I'm doing design editing in Wolf School, my monthly membership. Once a month, we have a group coaching call and Wolf School members can send me in their designs to edit them. Most of the time people watch what I'm doing because I'll do it live in Canva and I'm moving elements around. I'm replacing words. I'm changing colors. And everybody's like, Brittany, Teach us how to do what you're doing. Like you do it so effortlessly. It looks like you're not even trying and it looks a hundred times better. That's how I want to be. And I say, yeah, because I have 10 years of building a mental archive under my belt. So when I'm doing it, it doesn't feel hard. It doesn't feel like work. My brain automatically knows what to do next because I have a big mental archive, not because what I was born with it, not because I'm lucky, because I've worked for it. I've done the intentional work of building that subconscious space in my mind to make it look like what I'm doing is magic when it's really not magic at all, okay? So let's put this in terms outside of print on demand to try to help you understand it a little better. Stick with me, this is gonna seem very random, but it's all gonna come together in a second. Say you have a living room, like the one pictured here, okay? It's pretty ugly, it's pretty, it's, it's in dire circumstances. <laughs> And you want to hire an interior designer to transform it. And you have a very specific vision of how you want the end result to look. Okay. So that's your starting point, but you have a very specific vision and you being the smart and savvy person that you are head to Yelp. You want to look at reviews. You want to look at experience level. You want to see who the best possible person might be for your interior design job to help create the specific vision that you want. So you go onto Yelp, you find this pool of interior design professionals, okay? You see there's a lot of them. Now, the little numbers that I've got on, on these professionals, these professional representatives, represent the number of years of experience, okay? So one has five years experience, the other one has a single year experience, one has eight years experience, the other one has three years experience. Who are you most likely to gravitate towards first and why? Now, I know how I do things. I love choosing people with lots of great reviews and, and a, a biggest number of years of experience possible, right? Because we know that the more experience somebody has in any profession or skill, the more expertise they have. Are you catching on to what I'm saying? Are you picking up what I'm putting down? So because the more the professional has experienced in the field, the larger their base of knowledge is about that topic. And you guys might be saying like, wow, Brittany, this is so obvious. Why are you even stating this? Because it's exactly how the mental archive works. The higher the level of their expertise, the more likely they are to satisfy you with their work and get your vision, right? So the mental archive, we'll go back to that example in a second of interior design, but the mental archive equals your ticket to mega seller status because your ability and your knowledge when you're first learning something is very, very small. 
okay, as represented by that tiny little dot you see in the brain of that, uh, that outline on the top, right? Your ability is very small in the beginning because your experience is very small, but your knowledge, as we're seeing in the second illustration down below, an ability after many hours of repetition and practice and mastery, that area of your brain grows larger. And going back to what we talked about before, if demand is king, if there's nothing more important than demand, what could be more important than understanding demand? And what could be more important than knowing exactly how to understand demand? Not much, right? So everybody has to start somewhere. And most of the time, you're going to suck at first when learning any new skill. Like I said, you sit down at a at a piano and you're really stoked to play Beethoven and you can't even play Mary Had a Little Lamb. Nobody's surprised. That's not surprising. That's how skills work. Same thing with print on demand. You're going to suck at first. Most people cannot tolerate sucking because they make it mean something about their identity. They make it mean something about their potential, their capability, their competency. But it's like you haven't even had any experience. Why are you expecting to be good and making a bunch of sales already? You have no idea what people want. You have no idea how to do what you're doing and you're expecting to exceed at really high levels. It doesn't make sense. So going back to the interior design example, what we're really wanting when we hire someone with experience is someone with a very well-primed brain. Remember I told you I coined the term brain priming. When it comes to researching for demand, we're priming our brain to understand the stuff that people are actually actively searching for. So in any case, even if we're hiring an interior design professional, we're going to choose the one most likely with the most years experience because they have the most well-primed brain when it comes to understanding how to be, bring people's visions to life. And I chose the interior design example because it's very emotional. You may have never thought of this before because many people don't, but aesthetics are directly correlated with emotion. And on Etsy, with when you're selling t-shirts, sweatshirts, hoodies, whatever, mugs even, stickers, whatever, people buy based on emotions, based on the emotional connection they have with whatever the design they're buying represents, okay? It's the same thing with interior design. You want a specific aesthetic for a specific room or whatever. You want your living room to look like this, whatever, in order to create a certain emotion in the room, a certain feeling in the room. So you're going to hire someone with experience in creating emotion. If you're really creating, uh, or if you're, if you're really wanting somebody to create your exact vision, we're talking on a level of emotion. Isn't that cool? When you think about it that way, we're always trying to create feelings. So say, um, these are actual real examples. I hired an interior designer a few years ago, maybe it was last year, um, to create sort of a vision I had. And I'm going to show you guys, this was my vision, right? I wanted really beautiful, soft, neutral tones, beige everything, basically. Like I wasn't into bright colors. I wanted the, pomp the pompous grass. I wanted the like beige vases, all of the, the velvet pillows. I wanted it to be very luxe and just really beautiful and light, airy feeling, right? I'm describing feelings. So I wanted to hire somebody with experience in transforming people's areas, whatever area that, that may be, into the vision of the feeling that they were aiming for, right? Here's another one last example. Now, if I hire somebody and they give me a room like this, this is missing the mark of the feeling I was shooting for. Not because this is a bad, a badly designed room, a poorly designed room. It's just missing the emotional mark. It may have been designed by somebody who has less experience, a less well-primed brain. They don't really get the emotional piece because they don't have as much experience, right? Same for this room. That eyeball painting is very scary. But it's like they might have shot and missed right? I, these are these are just random examples. I wanted you guys to make the comparisons, right? And, and I'm not saying that these are poorly designed rooms. Again, I'm just saying this is an example of missing the mark. Because guess what? Missing the mark emotionally is what happens to a lot of print-on-demand sellers and their designs. 
The size of someone's mental archive determines their level of expertise and ability to make connections and understand a specific vibe, meaning emotional connection. You guys, if emotions are what create sales on a basic level, if that's true, and it is 100% completely true, then what's more important than understanding how to create specific types of emotional connection with shoppers? Nothing. Understanding demand and then understanding how to create for that demand with emotional connection, that's your equation, right? A small mental archive often misses the mark. Why? The experience is lacking. Very, very, very simple stuff when we break it down, but nobody ever talks about this stuff, right? So not only is nobody breaking it down, nobody's talking about it to begin with. So small mental archives are not what we want. Now, this is what the mental archive of a beginner looks like. And this phase represents struggle. You're on the struggle bus here. Tons of trial and error when your mental archive is still small. You have lots of negative emotions. You have frustration triggered by uh, your current incompetency due to your lack of experience. It's all a natural part of the learning curve process, you guys. Everything that you're feeling, all of that frustration, all of that negative emotion, just like the baby bird that's falling out of the tree, being like, what the F did my mom just make me do? by hopping out of this tree to follow her. I don't know what I'm doing. This is disorienting. I'm doing backflips. I'm falling at, you know, 40 miles per hour toward the ground. <laughs> it's weird. It's uncomfortable. It feels frustrating. It's a natural part of learning how to do what you need to do. And a part of that is being able to tolerate it, being mentally tough enough to tolerate it. Most people quit in this phase. The expert. When that mental archive is big, it's juicy, it's overflowing, their intuition is strong, they're really good at creating designs, they're even better at emotional connection and fusing that into their designs. So this, a big mental archive, this, not a perfect title and tags combination, that helps, but that's not what people think it is. The mental archive is what builds and maintains consistent sales and mega seller status. This and only this, only this is what creates lasting success. Because if you have everything else and you don't have this, you're not going to succeed long term. If you have everything else and you don't have this, you can kiss mega seller status goodbye. It's not going to happen, right? So this is the most important thing maybe of this whole thing that I want you guys to hear and remember. Most sellers are trying to achieve the results that only come with the large mental archive level while still being on the small mental archive level. I'm going to say this one more time because it is so important. The most important thing I'll say over this, these three days, most of most sellers, most of you in this workshop here today, I know this for a fact because I work with all of you. I'm not condemning anybody, but I'm saying I'm going to be very real with you. I see this all the time. People saying, I've been at this two months, not getting any results. Where are my sales? Why is everybody succeeding so much faster? I can't even look at mega shops because I get so jealous, right? Most sellers are trying to achieve the results of a giant mental archive while still being on the level of a small mental archive. And it's fine that you have a small mental archive, but stop expecting big mental archive level results because it's not realistic. It's not feasible. It doesn't work that way. Most sellers feel entitled to the level of results other sellers already on the big mental archive level are getting while still being on the small mental archive level. They feel entitled. They're like, why do they get the results and I don't? They must have better SEO. No. They might have better SEO, but that's not the reason they're making tons more sales than you. Real talk here, you guys. This is real talk. Most sellers feel entitled. And it's like, if you're, a ch if you're, you know, an eight-year-old learning to play the piano and the kid next to you has been playing piano for two years, he knows how to play a Mozart song. It's the same level of logic to where the eight-year-old kid looks at the other kid who's playing Mozart and goes, why does he get to play Mozart? That's not fair. Why am I not able to play Mozart yet? That kid put in the time and he deserves to be able to play Mozart. 
in the same way that mega sellers who are achieving big results deserve to be achieving those results because they've spent the time building their mental archive and putting in the work and tolerating the uncomfortable learning curve. Okay, most sellers will absolutely berate themselves for not being on the big mental archive level immediately. They will berate themselves. They'll say, I'm so over this. I don't know why I'm not better. I don't know why I can't recreate sales faster. And they feel stupid for having to begin at the small mental archive level, just like everyone else. You guys, we got to stop this. We have to stop feeling stupid for starting at the same level that everybody else has to start at. Those mega sellers who are making $200,000 in 30 days, they started with the same stuff you, you're at where, right now. They just tolerated the learning curve. They put in the work. They kept a wolf mindset and they made it. They deserve to be there. You don't deserve to be there yet because you haven't tolerated the learning curve to the point where you get to break through it. You haven't put in the level of work that those mega sellers have. You get the level of results you deserve. I say this in every single workshop I ever put on because it's so important. It's one of the most tough love sentences that I say because it stings. And I know that, I get it. But you really truly do get the level of results that you deserve. Would you expect to pick up a basketball tomorrow and be able to play like Michael Jordan the next day? No, of course not. Why would you build a big, why would building a big booming business be any different? Why do we view this in a different way? It doesn't add up to me. It doesn't make sense. There's a learning curve in anything worth doing. So I need you guys to stop aiming for and expecting expert level results from a beginner level development stage. We need to stop aiming for those expert level results from a beginner level development stage. We have to be realistic about where we are and about the next baby step that we have to do in order to progress forward just a little bit. The problem is a lot of you are wanting to leap from beginner to expert. You're wanting to bypass the learning curve altogether. And if you can't, you want to quit. Doesn't make sense. Not logical. Stop focusing on results and start focusing on enhancing your level of expertise. And then the results will happen as a byproduct. They'll just flow in. It'll feel effortless. It'll feel like, oh my gosh, right? My only goal is to give you guys the tools you need to become more of the expert every day. Because I know results only flow after expertise is developed. My students win really, really big and very consistently on Etsy. This is half the reason why. Half of the reason is because they focus on becoming the expert, right? So you might be asking, okay, Brittany, all of this makes sense. What in the hell is the other half? The other half is database decision-making, right? So if we're looking at this as an actual equation, the first piece of the puzzle is mastering demand. If demand is king, emotional connection is king, emotions create sales, all of these facts that we now know to be the truth. If that's the way that it is, then we have to master demand. It's a, a crucial piece of the puzzle, right? The second piece of the puzzle is making database decisions. If you can combine these two things, mastering demand and making database decisions, you will create an actual Etsy empire. If you guys have not yet seen my Top Seller Secret Hall of Fame, it's a giant page of just winners, mega sellers that have come out of my master course incredible numbers that blow people's minds. They're like, I would have no, no idea that that was possible on Etsy if I hadn't seen that somebody did it. And it's just testimonial after testimonial after testimonial of people doing it because they combined these two puzzle pieces and they created an actual empire. It's tested and it's proven. And it's the only way to do this organically. No, no ads. My mega sellers, that's the first question when I do mega seller interviews, the first question everyone wants to know from the mega seller, do you run ads? You, go, you know what they say every single time? No. You know why? Because they follow the blueprint inside Top Seller Secret that shows you how to master demand and make database decisions. So you can leverage the organic algorithm of, of the 96 million shoppers on there every single year. Their empire just happens because they're focused in the right spot. So you guys, when I first started, I don't know how many of you in here know my story. I began as a little baby at 24 years old 
living in my parents' house because I quit my job. I was having a, a mid twenties crisis, right? I had nothing to do. So I decided to start an Etsy shop. I started with high-waisted shorts. I was printing these galaxy print shorts. There's a picture here of the watermelon shorts that I created. I did daisy shorts, unicorn shorts, whatever. Anything anybody wanted, any, anything anybody could wear to a festival, right? I would create it. When I first started 10 years ago, I had demand nailed pretty quickly. I really did. Uh, this happened, I've always had it kind of innately, like it was kind of my style anyways. And I recognized like, oh, I love these high-waisted shorts. Not a whole lot of people are selling them anywhere. Not a whole lot of stores are selling them. Basically nowhere is. I was going to Goodwill, creating them myself and wearing them. So I thought, I bet other girls want this too. So I kind of made that connection and had the demand and emotional connection nailed already. Then I realized people were wearing it to festivals and realized, oh, I can create more things people want to wear to festivals, right? And I put these little puzzle pieces together in my head. I was making database decisions at the time as well. My shop grew very quickly because I was doing this. I was observing what was selling and what my customers were telling me in Etsy messages that they wanted. And I was taking action accordingly. So I was taking all of this data and information, seeing what sales I was making, what products were selling, asking my customers to tell me more about what they wanted. And I was using that data that I could from my shop to build out. Now that's a hack, right? That's one way to do it. Takes a little bit longer, but it's definitely something that you wanna pay attention to no matter what. What's, what's happening in your shop is a source of data. However, it was not until I added in the magic layer of Etsy customer search data that my shop absolutely exploded. Absolutely exploded. So I had this data from my shop that I sort of, again, innately knew to pay attention to. What were my customers telling me they wanted and what was already selling? Let me just do more of that stuff, right? But then I discovered a little something called erank.com, you guys. It changed absolutely everything. It changed the way I went about my mental archive building. It, it, and by the way, mental, the term mental archiving, archiving, brain priming, even researching, I didn't realize I was doing any of this until I started teaching people how to do it four or five years ago and reverse engineered my process. I wasn't thinking like, oh, I have to build my mental archive today. I was just diving into information, right? Because at the base layer, that's all any of this is, is information. How do I fill my subconscious brain up with more information about what people want so I can give them more of it naturally and easily, right? So back to erank.com changed the entire game for me, still does to this day. Erank is, it's everything. It's top notch stuff, okay? So the two puzzle pieces, mastering demand, and then database decision-making with erank.com on your side, chef's kiss, six-figure seller, mega status. Six-figure mega seller status, I should say, okay? That is the equation for greatness when it comes to leveraging the organic Etsy traffic stream and building a six-figure shop without ads and without driving traffic from anywhere else. You don't need to create a shop Instagram account. You don't even need Pinterest. Okay. You don't need anything to build a six figure shop, but the ability to master demand, building your mental archive and making database decisions, especially with erank.com. You do not need anything else. And I could scream this from the rooftops forever. And most people still aren't going to believe me, right? Because they haven't actually seen it happen. I have, I've seen it happen thousands of times. I've seen shops explode over and over again and then reverse engineered. How did that happen? How did my students make that happen? How did I make it happen? How can I teach more people this formula? This is the formula right here, okay? So the majority of sellers, they definitely are missing crucial pieces of the puzzle. Their map is wrong. So they keep ending up in the wrong destination, not getting as many sales as they would like, not succeeding at the level that they would like because they're missing cr crucial pieces. And then they're throwing in the towel far too early because when you're missing pieces of a puzzle, yeah, it's going to be really frustrating continuing to sit there and try to put a puzzle together when you're missing pieces of it. Of course, you're going to quit because it doesn't make sense. You feel like you're wasting time. It's frustrating. You throw in the towel, right? Enter top seller secret. Now, 
In a moment, I'm going to do some pretty big giveaways. So I need you guys to stick around. If you're on the Instagram live right now, you want to click the link in my, in my bio and get into the Zoom call because these giveaways are going to be really big. But I, I want to ask you guys if you allow me to speak about Top Seller Secret for just one second because it is it changes people's lives for a very specific reason. Not being what I just spoke about a second ago, those puzzle pieces, they're extremely important. So stick with me. The giveaways are going to happen in a second. I'm going to talk through this for just a couple more minutes, and then I'm going to come back and I'm going to do these big giveaways, okay? So the magic of Top Seller Secret is that it reveals all of my unique step-by-step -step processes for data-based decision-making, and nothing is left off the table, you guys, okay? I am not a secret keeper, I want to see you win. If my goal is to see you win at the highest levels, like all of my other mega seller students, I can't keep any secrets. I have to give you everything I've got. And my job, honestly, I'm always trying to figure out how to, to, to create more clarity, to find out more secrets of other sellers and to add them into, into my map if need be, like just figuring out all of the best top notch, highest level ways that people are making stuff happen and then boil it down in the most easy to understand ways and then hand it to you guys. Okay. Cause I, I want you to win. That is my ultimate goal. So top seller secret is your strategic foundation. It's got your demand and research information. Yes, it has SEO. It's got eRank.com, your titles and your tags and your product research and your database decision making and everything that you need to know regarding all of that we just talked about as that puzzle piece, right? That's the magic of Top Seller Secret is it breaks that, all of that down so you know exactly where to go on E-Rank. You know exactly how to use it. It's so easy a toddler could do it because it's color-coded. We're using one feature. Uh, it teaches you how to niche down with the scientist detective gymnast phases. You're testing, you're experimenting, you're figuring out what works, and then you're building out on what works depending on the data that you're collecting. It shows you exactly how to do that. It teaches you six-figure seller mindset, which is one of the most important things because if you're not thinking like a six-figure seller, you can't make decisions like a six-figure seller. And if you can't make decisions like a six-figure seller and choices like a mega seller, then you're not going to get mega seller results. It's all about your decision making. So you've got to learn how to think that way in order to make choices that way. And then of course, there's bestseller design templates that you can use in Canva. There's customer service information. There's saved replies that you can use and just plug into your shop. There's so much of this, okay? So your Etsy empire, I want everyone to understand this. You have to start with a solid strategic foundation. So this entire workshop is about your mental archive. I've just hammered it into you that you have to understand demand. You have to become an expert in knowing what people want, but you need your foundation. And I call them your pillars, your supporting pillars of what's going to allow you to do the best that you can in terms of results in the fastest way possible. That's your SEO. That's your E-Rank strategy. That's your customer service. That's your scientist detective gymnast phase. That's your strategic stuff. That's got to be solid first. Most people are missing the strategic foundation. That's why I tell everybody, get into Top Seller Secret first and foremost before you do anything else, right? Before you build a shop, before you get listings up, understand your strategic foundation first so you don't have to go back and correct a bunch of your mistakes or, or go back and have all this wasted time. And then step two is the demand stuff. It's building the mental archive. It's building your expertise. But having the strategy first and then diving into the research and understanding demand, that's the way I wish I could have done it back in 2014. But I had no resources back then. There weren't courses. There weren't gurus. There weren't experts, right? I had to actually start with understanding demand and, and like work my way backwards, which was really confusing. I wish I would have had the strategic foundation because that is what allows people to take off at lightning speeds, being able to understand E-Rank and customer data and all this good stuff. So mastering demand, database decision-making, six-figure seller status, okay? Mastering demand is about step two. Database decision making, database decision making is about step one. That's solid strategic foundation. And if you're watching this and you're in top seller secret, it can also help to understand this this way as well, to think about it a little bit differently. Go back through the course, strengthen your strategic foundation, right? It's that important. If you're feeling wobbly still, it's because your, your foundation isn't solid enough. Maybe you need more to spend more time understanding it. Maybe you need to work with it more. Maybe you need more practice right? It's everything. It makes all the difference. So before I do the giveaways, I want to talk to you guys about the special offer for the next 24 hours only. If you join Top Seller Secret and you're not already in Top Seller Secret, I am doing the most fun thing I think I've ever done, which is an entire week of lives. 
for Top Seller Secret students only. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, in the second week of February, I'm gonna be in front of this screen doing five lives in a row for Top Seller Secret students only, specifically on exactly what I would be doing if I were trying to build an explosive, I'm gonna say multi six-figure shop because I like shooting for the stars right now. So five days of talking about different topics of what I would be doing. Now I did a four day live like this uh, for Top Seller Secret students back in uh, September. And most people's favorite day, I did a couple of different topics. Most people's favorite day was for one day I focused on what I would be doing if I were trying to build a, a mega seller shop or a mega uh, shop in general. That was most people's favorite day. So I decided I want to spend five whole days on it. Okay. I'm going to be talking about what I would be doing with mock-ups. I'm going to be talking about what I would be doing on erank.com and how I would be structuring my SEO. All of this stuff is already in the course on a, on a basic level, but I'd be talking about I'm going to be talking about what I would be doing with it right now. I'm going to be talking about what I would be, be doing with designs, what I would be using, how I would be using it, colors, all that sort of stuff. I'm going to be talking about trends I'd be taking advantage of this year. I'm going to be talking about shop aesthetic and the branding that I would be doing in 2024 if I were starting from the bottom and trying to build an explosive shop. Okay, so much more than this will be covered as well. But I'm going to put myself in your guys' shoes for five full days. Again, this is totally free. If you sign up in the next Next 24 hours. If you're already in Top Seller Secret, you will have full access to this as well. But if you do not have access yet to Top Seller Secret, if you sign up in the next 24 hours before day two, you're going to get access to this as well. Okay. Again, I've never done this before. I could not be more excited about it. I feel like it's going to be so rich and so full of value because I'm just going to be able to vibe with you guys. I'm going to say, okay, if I were you, this is what I would do. If I were you, this is what I would do. And then I would do this. And then I would combine this and I would use this, like all the resources, all of the trend information. Everything that I've got, I'm going to be spilling in those five days. Okay. So like I said, please believe I will be spilling all the tea for five days straight. And I don't even have to see the chat to know you guys are freaking out because I know a lot of you in Top Seller Secret are in this workshop right now. And you're so excited to do this because you were probably in the last four day live, the five day live, it's going to top it. It's going to be so much uh, stronger with so much more information. Okay. So I'll be putting the link in the chat box of the Zoom uh, if you want to join, but you can also find it in my Instagram bio and there will be a link also in the emails going out with today's replay. Joining from this link, this is very important, you guys, joining from this link will also grant you every single giant bonus that's possible that comes with Top Seller Secret. There are so many and they're really, really, really big and really, really, really juicy. And if you join from this link, you're gonna get access to that five day live and you're gonna get all of the bonuses, okay? Super exciting. You gotta make sure it's from that link only. 24 hours, join now, okay? Until uh, day two, 4 p.m. Pacific tomorrow, you only have 24 hours, all right? Okay, you guys are feeling motivated, excited. Our boys allowed what our boys allowed hundred percent, Daniel. I have quite a few men um in the uh in Top Seller Secret that are doing very, very, very well. A little tip, you guys, men don't take even close enough advantage of Etsy. There's such a huge market for even for creating men's stuff or for men creating women's stuff, it doesn't matter. It, it, you guys have the advantage and you don't even know it. Uh, what are the dates again? I don't have specific dates yet, but I will announce them second week in February. Uh, yes, Top Seller Secret students only. So that's another reason to get into Top Seller Secret if you are not already in Top Seller Secret because I am launching a mastermind soon. It will be so exclusive. It's going to be so small and so exclusive that the, the access you get to me will be extremely high level. Very excited. I think this will be coming in February. Um, so get into Top Seller Secret so you can learn the foundation first. I'm going to keep pasting the link for the Top Seller Secret offer in the chat. Uh, will you be emailing the link for the mastermind or for the replay? For the mastermind, I'll be announcing it to Top Seller Secret students. There will be an email and probably in the Facebook group. Yes, there will, I guarantee you, be a wait list. I guarantee you because it's going to start off very, very, very small. It will be a high ticket offer as all of my um, close proximity offers are because it takes so much of my energy to do it. But for those that are really wanting to get to the next level, it's going to be so good. Um, if we're already in Top Seller Secret, do, do we need to sign up for the lives in February separately? No, you do not. Okay. Uh, the Top Seller Secret Facebook group, uh, if you're in Top Seller Secret, you will see it in the welcome module. Okay. 
if you're in Top Seller Secret, it's in the welcome module. The link is there. Please do not request to follow the Top Seller Secret group if you're not in Top Seller Secret. It wastes so much of my time having to manually sort through who is and who isn't. So please do not. How can I motivate myself to get started and be consistent in creating designs? Okay, so yeah, as I'm answering this, you guys, as you're thinking of questions, keep them coming in the chat, okay? Um, motivating yourself to get started will be different for everybody, right? A lot of times there is not necessarily a huge motivation to get started. A lot of times if you get into one of my workshops, people will say like that it was such a big motivation for me to see you speak and to hear your how much excitement you had and to see all of your mega sellers. Like I cannot wait to begin and open my shop and just go. But it might not be super motivating for somebody else. They might be like, well, that made sense and I loved it. But at the same time, I, I'm still scared, right? So you have to figure out like where you are. If you're not motivated to start, it could just be because you have a lot of fear blocks. That's the, the way it is for most people is like they're so scared of not being able to move forward because they're afraid of failure that they just don't feel ever motivated to start. So it's, it's building a level of self-awareness to be like, if I'm not motivated to even open my shop or get started, what are the fears in my way and how can I address those fears? Consistent in creating designs, that's just discipline. Right. A lot of people will will have processes or whatever. The way that I work, the more I research, the more I have to design, the more I'm like dying to get into Canva. Right. So I'll be researching and I'll be going back and forth between Canva and research and Canva and research and Canva and research because I'm like, ooh, I can do this and I can do this and I can do this. And like, I don't need any motivation because I'm so inspired. So inspiration is so much more powerful for me than motivation. Right. Because like motivation is almost like you're moving in order to get a certain result. You're like, I want to be a six figure seller. So I have to motivate myself to get there. I like to detach myself from the results altogether. I like to be totally detached and say, what's what am I inspired by? That's going to pull me when you're motivated. You're kind of being pushed and it can feel a little bit sticky, a little bit full of resistance. But when you're inspired, it's like nobody could hold you back. There's nothing anybody could do to stop you from making moves because you're so inspired. And that's when um, knowing how to research and knowing what to look for and allowing it to be really fun. That's where that comes in handy. You don't need motivation. You need inspiration. When you're inspired, you're moving from a much more creative place. Things are a lot more open and free flowing, and you're going to achieve a lot more than you ever realized possible, right? How do you prevent analysis paralysis? I find myself researching and then feeling overwhelmed on where to start. Um, the reason why you feel overwhelmed on where to start is because you don't want to start in the wrong place. What I want to say about that is it's impossible to start in the wrong place. You've got to try a bunch of stuff anyways. So just pick what seems the most interesting and go. A lot of people do this and they don't realize it's a subconscious block. They're like, oh, I'm overwhelmed. You're just telling yourself you're overwhelmed because it means you don't have to start anywhere. That's real talk. So pick what feels like the, the most inspiring, fun thing to do first and do it. Start with one. You have a list of things. You're like, oh, I found all this stuff. It, like that's the greatest problem ever. You're too, you're overwhelmed by all the ideas you have. Congratulations. Congratulations. That's amazing. The problem is people are attached to their results. They're thinking, where should I start to get results the fastest? Stop thinking that way. Detach from results altogether. Because when you're doing it that way, there's like, that's why you're overwhelmed because you don't want to do it wrong because you want to get to results as fast as possible. When we detach from results, and we say, I'm doing this because I'm in the learning curve. I need to practice anyways. I'm just going to start with feel, what feels the most fun and the most interesting and the most clear to me right now. That's when you start creating magic because you're detached. It's not about results. You're not thinking about, oh, it's going to work the fastest. You're just thinking about what feels the most fun and the most inspiring right now. Right? Um, Sarah says, that's great advice. Thank you. You guys, this is so much more about fun and inspiration than you think. Most of you, I'd say 98% of you are taking it way too seriously. When I started with, with high-waisted shorts, I was literally just having the time of my life. I was literally just having fun. And it was like, oh, I could do this. Oh, I could do a daisy print. Oh, I could do a galaxy print. I could add glitter and I could do this and this and this and this. And that was when I was actually hand creating stuff. Then when I started doing print on demand, I was like, oh, 
mermaids. I could do seashells. I could do, I'm actually a mermaid. I could do this. Oh, they'd love this. And I was always thinking about how I could surprise and delight my customers even more. So it was so much fun. It was never like, how do I get results faster? How do I get to a six figure seller status? How do I do this? How do I do that? I was just like, how can I make my customers more happy and more excited? And, and you do that by getting happy, excited and having fun yourself and stop, stop it with the results attachment. Eliminate it, you guys. It's the best possible thing you could do for your business. Yeah, I always reply to TSS week four when I need to boost a boost in motivation. Yeah, um, top seller secret week four is uh, the seven deadly mentality sins. It is so extremely powerful because it talks about the seven things that most people do that blocks them from moving forward. It's how not to think, right? So if you are in top seller secret, revisit that week four as often as you need. In the beginning, do you spend more time researching any and all niches you can find data for or on three to five niches, et cetera? What are we looking for per niche versus broad trends? Really good question, Tiffany. This is what's broken down in Top Seller Secret. There's a, it's systematic. It's step-by-step. Step. There's step one, step two, step three, step four, step five. And when you break it down into bite-sized pieces, it's so much easier to move through it. It's so much easier to just sort of flow into what you need to do. And the next Step is very intuitive because everything logically makes sense. So to answer this question in a, in a very simplified way, do you spend more time researching any and all niches you can find data for or on three to five niches? Um, it's, it's making a list and it's going through whatever feels the most interesting and fun right then and there and what you think will resonate with your customers most if you already have some sales. There are a ton of different variables, but the most important thing to know is that there's really not a wrong way to do it. There is the, the squirrel brain where you can be trying too many things at once and you're making like one or two designs per niche and you've tried 50 niches. So you never actually go deep enough. There, there is that sort of thing at play. But in terms of just having fun and following whatever, whatever is fun for you right now and you understand the most, the reason why I talk about fun is because when you're having fun with something, it means you understand it on an emotional level. And most people don't realize this. Most, nobody talks about this, right? When you're having fun with something, it means you understand it on an emotional level. And when you understand something on an emotional level, you can easily create emotionally connected designs for it. And what did we learn today about emotions? That they create what? Sales. So I'm not telling you to have fun because I'm like, just lighten up, just be easy breezy, just have fun. I'm telling you to have fun because that unlocks massive mega seller status. <laughs> I'm telling you to have fun because it's a huge unlock because your fun is where your understanding is. That's why if you try to design for a niche that you don't love yourself or that you don't understand at all, or that you haven't done any research on, you're not going to be good at creating designs that sell because you don't have any understanding of the emotional connection. And so nobody's buying your stuff because the emotion isn't creating the sales because there's no emotional connection there. Get it? So if you follow your fun, you don't even have to think on a, on a conscious level. You don't have to think, hmm, do I understand this? Do I understand this niche on an emotional level? You don't even have to do that because your barometer is how much fun you're having with it. Because if you're not having fun, I can guarantee you, if you pick a niche that you don't really understand, that you don't emotionally connect with, you will not have fun when you're designing for it. It's like me trying to design goth designs. I always use this example because I do not understand the goth trend. I love it. I think it's so cute and aesthetic and it's very, very in with the Y2K stuff nowadays. I do not emotionally connect with the goth thing. So if I sit down and I try to create designs for it, I'm going to get frustrated. It's not fun. It's not fun. And so the designs that I put out for it are going to be forced. They're not going to have emotional connection and they're not going to make sales. So follow what feels fun and inspiring. Trust yourself more. Rosalia says, I just got into TSS. Congratulations, Rosalia. Love that for you. You're not going to regret it. It will probably be your best decision of 2024. How do you manage the listing process? I love this question. If we do multiple designs, like from the challenge, listing all of them is tedious and lengthy. Any tips, suggestions for streamlining the process? Okay, you guys are taking the listing thing way too seriously. And Kay, I'm not coming for you whatsoever. I'm talking about on a general sense. I hear this constantly. People being like, how do I manage listings? How do I do it to where it make it faster? I hate it. I feel really creative while I'm doing the designs and then I hate the listing process. You guys, this is just like any other job. There's going to be pieces of it that you don't love as much that you have to do anyways. I hear a lot of people putting stuff into drafts. They get really crazy with, you know, like doing the designs or having a bunch of fun and then they just leave stuff in their drafts. 
because they don't want to do the listing stuff. And it's like, it's part of your job. You don't get to just have the fun and then be like, mm, I don't love that as much. So I'm just going to like keep doing this. And I know I just said, follow the fun, but there also has to be a balance of discipline in terms of actually getting stuff out there. So what helps me a lot is I'm excited throughout the whole process. I'm excited from when I start the research to when I'm creating the design. And I'm just as excited to list the product to actually do that tedious listing product process as I am while I'm creating the design, because I'm keeping in mind the fact that once I get it out, I get to see how excited my customers are for it. I get, there's the potential of that listing blowing up. If it sits in my drafts, there's no potential. So I allow the excitement to drive me the whole way. It's like, yeah, I got to get it up. I can do it very quickly. I could just, you know, not take this too seriously. I don't have to think about how tedious it is. I just need to do it and I get to see what happens. And you can copy and paste titles on similar listings. There's little hacks you could do. I, I recommend copying and pasting your descriptions, copying and pasting whatever you can cuts down on a lot of it. But you guys, it takes me maybe 10 minutes total to create mock-ups, to copy titles and tags and descriptions, and to get a listing up. Like maybe 10 minutes. And it's not hard. And I've never once felt like, oh, I hate this, right? Because that excitement is there the whole way through. It's part of the entire thing. It's part of the fun. So I think what people really want is they want like, do this first, then go here, then do this, then do this. I'll create the mock-ups. I'll go into Printify Editor. I'll place the design on the mock-up. I'll publish it. Then I'll take my Canva mock-ups. I'll put it into the Etsy ed editor. I'll finish the rest of it. And I'll just publish that. Bitch. Like, excuse my French, but... It happens very quickly. <laughs> I get it out there and it, it's just done, right? I think it's an overthinking thing um, from what I've gathered in the listing process. How much time do you spend on customer service questions? Uh, depends how many there are. I'm not sure what you mean, Lauren, but um, you know, I, I take the time to talk to my customers. I have a lot of saved reply templates. I share those in Top Seller Secret as well. Um, you're going to get the same types of questions a lot. If I am getting the same types of questions, I'll make sure that the answers to those questions are built into text graphics in every listing and in my description so I can eliminate the majority of those people getting into my inbox and, you know, using up my time. I'll make sure that the answers to those questions are in the listing, but otherwise I use save reply templates and I make sure everybody's questions are answered. Do you still run any shops to test out new strategies? Of course. Yeah, I'll always be on Etsy. Um, so I know what's happening. I just opened my shop, how to pick a niche or, or my way to start. Yeah, Lauren says Top Seller Secret explains all of this. So if you're just new, you're just opening your shop, you need to get into Top Seller Secret. Picking your niche depends on database decision-making. Please do not just be like, you know what? Brittany said to follow the fun. I'm going to create a hibiscus shop. All of my listings are going to be hibiscus based. I love flowers. Other people probably love hibiscus is as well. I don't even know how you say it. I make hibiscus plural, hibiscus. <laughs> don't do that, right? Because there's no data. You don't know if people are actually looking for hibiscus flowers. So many people do this. They're like, I like it. So other people must too. That's not how it works. Just because people like something doesn't mean they're actually actively searching for it. And if we're trying to leverage organic traffic, we have to be positive that people are actually actively searching for it. So you've got to be able to leverage that customer data decision-making process through what I strategically lay out in Top Seller Secret, uh, my E-Ring strategy, in order to make those choices in the most intelligent way possible to where you're not just throwing stuff at the wall and guessing, okay? Database decision-making is your key. Kate says, yes, motivation versus inspiration. Love that you like that distinction. Elena says, thank you. So helpful. You're welcome. Should we stop designing sweatshirts in the summer and only focus on t-shirts? Um, not necessarily. No, I don't think so. Uh, I think, I, I mean, maybe t-shirts make more sense in the summer, but I would still always put stuff if it makes sense on a sweatshirt and a hoodie as well. Opposite of analysis paralysis. So much data, so many ideas gives me squirrel brain. I have the hardest time following through on a niche to see how it does. I'm all over the place at the moment. Okay to jump around or really set some discipline and build out on one niche trend idea at a time. So Mariana, this is very dependent. Um, there's a million variables that go into this, right? Like how many listings are you doing? What is your customer like? Do you have any sales? Do you have any data? Like squirrel brain can get really bad. Here's the most important distinction for this. 
my biggest question when people tell me tell me they have squirrel brain is where is the intention coming from do you have squirrel brain because you want to get more results faster do you have squirrel brain because you think you're missing out on something if you don't try it or do you have squirrel brain because you're coming from a place of inspiration and you're like, I have to try this because it'd be really fun. I have to try this because I just got this idea. I have to try this because I would love to see how this would come together. Because if you're doing it from that perspective, I'm okay with a little bit of squirrel brain. I really am. Because it means you're having fun. And when you're having fun, you're being creative and you're creating designs that are emotionally connective, right? So being a little squirrel brain is okay. If you're being squirrel brain because you're wanting results faster and you're having FOMO, and so you're trying everything under the sun because you keep getting distracted thinking the next niche is your, your ticket, I have a very, very, very big problem with squirrel brain. So Mariana, I'm, I'm not sure if you're in top seller secret or not, but if you are, what I would say to eliminate squirrel brain, um, use the best seller training to where you're using those templates, use your E-rank keyword list when you're choosing, you're, you're doing your product selection selection based on data, get that list. Choose three or four niches that pop out and seem like the most fun to you. And then, yeah, stick with those for a week, two weeks, three weeks. Keep your creation stuff based in data, but allow yourself to, if you're, if you're doing this from fun and flow, instead of where are my results? How do we get them faster? Squirrel brain, squirrel brain, squirrel brain then you can jump around a little bit more. Does that make sense? How much time should we spend a day in designing or updating our shop? There is no number, okay? If you're new, then you should be spending as much time as you can, as much time as you're having fun, as much time as you're feeling inspired, as much time as you're being creative. You will never hear me give a specific number. People say, how many listings should I have? How long should I be spending? How much should I be doing this? How soon should I delete listings if they're not working? stuff that doesn't matter. How much time you're spending, it's like quantity versus quality, right? I don't know how high quality your work is. So I, it, you could get really great stuff done in three hours, or you could get great stuff done in six hours. It depends on your level of expertise. It depends on what level you're at in general. So I, I don't ever give specific numbers, but spend as much time as you need to. When I first started, 12 hours a day, not because I was trying to get fast results because I was having so much fun, it didn't even feel like work and I literally could not stop myself, right? It's the difference between flow and force. Most of you are forcing it. Most of you are thinking I gotta spend eight hours so I could get results faster. And the mega sellers are over here being like, la da da, three hours doing this and it's really fun and maybe four hours today, but two hours today. And they're just like having so much fun probably spending a lot less time because they're focused in more emotionally connective areas for them. Does that make sense? How long is too long to spend on one design? Jennifer, um, I, I'm not going to give you a number on that either. Obviously, that's um, there's no specific number. I would say uh, if you need to get up and like if you're feeling like you're really caught up in a design and you're like, it's just like making your brain kind of like melt and you're stuck, get up and walk away. Come back later. But there's no like amount of time you should be like, okay, I give up on this design, right? It's gonna there's so many variables to it. But don't be spending three hours on every design, right? Your your design should be a lot simpler than that. If you're if you find you're spending a ton of time on designs, you're gonna be spending more time in the beginning because it's a learning curve. Just like you're gonna spend a lot of time to learn first how to play Mary Had a Little Lamb on a on a piano, right? Um, you're gonna be spending time in designs probably longer than you feel that you should because you're in the learning curve. But if you're spending two hours on design, on single designs, yeah, that is too long, right? You're being a perfectionist and perfectionism is rooted in fear of not being enough, not being good enough, not being perfect enough, right? We got to let that go. So focus on simplicity first and just let things be simple and don't get caught up in perfectionism. Uh, I started six months ago and I'm having too much fun in Canva and have a lot of listings that have never sold three plus months. When do you delete the listings that have sold? <laughs> Rosalie, I just mentioned this. It doesn't matter. One, you guys literally it, hear me when I say this. Once you list an item, it's in the ethers. Godspeed. Never look at it again. I'm, I'm dead serious. Never look at it again. You don't have to delete it. It'll, you know, if you have automatic renewals or whatever set, it'll renew or expire on its own. But you don't have to hover over 
any of your listings ever. You don't have to delete listings that aren't selling. You don't have to do any maintenance of that. If it is selling, all you need to know about is what's working. And if it is working, you're going to see it in your sales. So don't delete listings. Don't hover over things being like, is this, has this worked yet? Oh, I really thought it was going to work. Why isn't it working? I thought it was going to be a bestseller for sure. Why don't people like it? We're not doing any of that. We're literally hitting publish and then saying goodbye forever, unless you're a winner. And then I'll see you soon. I'm dead serious. Do not waste time on stuff that isn't working. Ashley says, just what I wanted to hear today. Perfect reminder. Rain says, TSS is the best. You should do it. Maria says, I'm nervous to buy Top Seller Secret because it's a big investment. I've taken Etsy courses. I've paid to be in communities, paid for resources, watched all the big Etsy YouTubers, and I've been on Etsy for two years, so I know I'm doing something wrong. <clears throat> Bree says, I can tell you I've taken all the Etsy courses. None of them are actually teaching it the way that Britt teaches it. Those courses may give you some sales here and there, but they're not consistent sales. Bree is correct. Um, I said this on a live the other day when I was on Instagram, and I'll say it again. I'm going to be that brave. There is no other course that... Um, there is no other course that delivers like top seller secret period. There's no other course creating as many mega sellers that on Etsy organically without ads, without driving traffic. Are you kidding me? Nothing comes close. You guys, as I continue to say the map in the course tested and proven over and over and over and over and over again, the only variable is your, as you, as the seller, your level of execution. If you're committed to this, we know the map works. <laughs> it's proven. I'm going to put in the uh I'm going to put in the chat here the website for you guys to see the Hall of Fame if you haven't already. It's all the proof you need. Okay? Um the course works. There's no need to be nervous. Like I said, somebody Rosalia just said she got in. It'll it will be her best decision of 2024. It will be her best decision because we know it works. And if you're committed, and you're executing, it's going to work for you. Jennifer says, Brittany is so different than the big YouTubers, much better in my opinion. Thank you, Jennifer. I I all, I believe 110% it comes down to just me being able to um, reverse engineer what I did and then not sugarcoat or put fluff on anything ever. I give things to you as straight and unfiltered and undiluted as possible. And that's why people win so quickly is because there's no di dilution. I'm not, I don't do clickbait. I don't do stuff that won't get you anywhere. I don't tell you stuff you want to hear that isn't actually going to work for you. I don't do any of that. I do not operate in that way on a human level. Like you can ask my friends, my family, it's not how I operate. And it's the same in my business. I don't have time for sugarcoating and I only want to get you guys results. That's my only goal. Are the TSS lives from September still in there and will they be replaced with the new five day lives? No, the, the four day lives that were done, they were, it was a 30 day thing only. <clears throat> uh, can you have more than one niche in a shop or do you start new shops for each niche? No, keep one shop only for everything. Do not open multiple shops. People think opening more than one shop is going to double their potential. What it actually does is cuts it in half. Yes. If you don't believe me, you can ask anybody in the Facebook groups because everybody hears me say that and everybody tries it anyway. And then everybody comes back to me and says, you know what, Brady, you are right. How many products would you suggest to start a shop? Um, aim for 50 listings, I'd say in the first one to two months, but it's 100% quality over quantity. You want to be doing more researching than you're doing designing in the beginning. Because if you're creating a bunch of designs on a really tiny mental archive, like we talked about, horrible waste of time. <laughs> so you got to build your mental archive at first, but you don't want to only focus on that and then not start practicing design. You need to have some balance and you need to be practicing both. Just don't overdo it on the designing while you still have a small mental archive. Off topic, do you have a pricing strategy for selling embroidered items? Whatever makes you the most money, profit margins, baby. You can sell you can sell embroidery for a lot of money. People are willing to pay a lot for it, just like it was for tie-dye Brie. Um, people would pay whatever. Embroidery is the same. They understand that it's a higher price point. So figure out your numbers, run the numbers, and then price accordingly to make yourself the most money that you can from it. Rosalia says, woohoo, I already feel it. You're going to love it. Guarantee. If you're listing similar items, you can just copy the listing and change the needed info. It helps. Yeah, totally. Get Bella helps a lot. There's also a bulk editor in, in Etsy that is super helpful as well. Um, okay. 
am I a weirdo because I like doing the listening part? Holly, I don't think that's weird at all. It, it was the first I ever heard when, when people started saying like, oh, I hate listening. It's so tedious. It's so hard. It's so this, it's so that. I don't understand. I still don't really understand it. Um, but I think it's just because I probably am a weirdo in that I love everything about what I do. I love every single piece of the Etsy print on demand puzzle. Um, maybe we're just weirdos. Uh, okay. <laughs> Starting up my hibiscus shop now. Nobody start a hibiscus shop. Thanks. That's helpful. I recently had a bestseller and I'm getting a ton of questions about shipping timelines. I love the idea to put the info in a text graphic since I guess no one is reading my description or FAQs. Yeah. Putting it in front of their face in a text graphic is a great way to do it. And I even have a saved reply template. Anytime somebody um, buys something from me, I manually go in and message them that message and it has all the shipping information in it. You don't have to do that. A lot of people don't want to do that after every single sale. It takes you three seconds throughout the day, literally three seconds to just hit a saved reply template and hit send. Um, and I find that it eliminates a lot of bad reviews or exchange requests or whatever, because they know what the deal is up front. If they didn't look at the text graphics that they didn't see it in the description, they're going to see it in the message most likely. Charlene says, this has been so great, Brittany. Thank you. I have to go feed my baby. Can't wait for tomorrow. Thank you, Charlene, for being here. Okay. Oh my God. I'm so behind on messages here. I have so many Canva tabs open right now. So many ideas I'm working on. Uh, that's good. Too many ideas is good. Everybody always says like, I have this problem. I have too many ideas. I have too many things I want to do. And I'm like, that doesn't sound like a problem to me. Just do what feels like the most fun. I stopped worrying about finding a niche and place all my focus on supply and demand. I don't even think about settling into a niche anymore. Yeah. People like are, they're aiming for a specific niche. They're like, what niche should I be in? It's like, you'll get there. You'll get there naturally, especially if you're in Top Seller Secret and following the, the steps that you need to follow. You're going to land in your niche completely naturally, and it's going to be the best possible niche for you where you're going to make the most money because you went through the scientist detective gymnast phases in order to get you to that spot. What are the apps you guys use to edit mock-ups and pics? I, I just use Canva. It's okay to have over 500 listings. Yeah, it's, it's okay to have a million listings, but like it's not going to help. You know, quantity doesn't help you. Quality, meaning level of demand, is what helps you. Uh, have you updated an old design? Uh, maybe if I feel like I need to change it, but I'll create a new listing for it. Um, but most of the time, it's not worth it. Do you set things up automatically to renew or only when something sells? I think I have my stuff on auto renew. All those gurus on YouTube tell you to go advertise first. Yeah, I mean gurus on YouTube, they're popular for a reason, right? They tell people what they want to hear based on what they know new sellers' expectations are. This is a huge topic, you guys. So they know that when people first start selling on Etsy, when they first start with print on demand, they know that these people think, I have to know how to advertise. I have to know how to do SEO. I have to know how to start a TikTok and Instagram and a Facebook group in order to get traffic to my shop. We know this isn't necessary. We know you can just do it a million times easier just by leveraging the 96 million shoppers that are already on Etsy every year, but new sellers don't know that. And so that's the path of a little bit more resistance, right? To teach people that. I'm up for that challenge because that's how I did it. And I think it's a million times the better way, the faster way, the more efficient way. Uh, but most Etsy gurus are going to teach you based on what they know that you think you need. And so they get the clickbait, they get the clicks, they get the views, they get the followers because people are saying they're teaching what I need because that's what they think they need. A lot of people fail because they operate based on their false assumptions of how something works. And in the meantime, it's not at all how it works, right? I think it's a really interesting thing. Um, and my job is harder because of that. My job is harder to convince people like, no, you don't need ads. No, you actually do not need to drive traffic. Most people don't believe me, right? So it does make my job harder, but I know for the people that I can convince, they're gonna get so much farther, so much faster. Will the same strategies for Etsy work for a Shopify store? Um, in terms of where we're talking about demand, of course, but when we're talking about uh, leveraging the organic Etsy algorithm. No, I do not suggest Shopify, especially if you don't already have a booming Etsy shop, you're going to fail. It's going to be really, really, really hard because you have to run ads. You have to um, do everything that you're doing on Etsy, but you don't have an organic traffic stream to test on. So it's a lot harder to be successful. 
And it takes a budget. It takes a big budget. It, ta it also takes knowing how to run Facebook ads. It's so much harder. You could get so much richer. I'm not, I'm dead serious. So much faster by leveraging Etsy. It's a better resource. There's a built-in traffic stream. Logically, from a business perspective, it makes a million times more sense, right? So you can have a Shopify and an Etsy at the same time, but I don't suggest doing that until you're very successful on Etsy first and then moving what you know to work on Etsy over to Shopify and then running them both at the same time. Thanks for everything. Have to go. Thank you for being here, Ivana. Once I found you, Brittany, I stopped looking at YouTube videos and listened to all those gurus. I was so lost and confused the first couple of months because of them. Yeah, Shannon, it's because they're teaching you what you want to hear. And when like, it's like a baby bird being like, no, I want the, this. Okay, so let's use the baby bird analogy. A baby bird becomes best friends with a possum that's also in the tree, right? And the baby bird's like, this possum is so cool. I want this one to teach me how to fly. And the possum's like, okay, I'll teach you how to fly. And then the possum can't fly. And so the baby bird is getting advice from someone that is giving the baby bird what it wants, but not what it needs, right? So the mom knows exactly how to teach the baby bird how to fly. She knows what it needs, but the possum is its best friend. So it wants to learn from that. It thinks it needs that, right? So if we, if we compare that to print on demand, um, a lot of gurus are just giving you what they think you want to hear in order to grow their own platform, not to actually help you be successful. Uh, do you only use one POD site? Yes, I, I love Printify. Kate says, trust me, people, Brittany does not tell you what you want to hear. <laughs> Only what you need and it's fire. Yeah, sorry about it, guys. I will never be the one to tell you what you want to hear. Like I said, my friends and family can also back this up. It's just how I am in life. I cannot tell anybody what they want to hear because I want to, I myself am so obsessed with growing and evolution. And I want the same thing for everybody around me that I just, I have to be honest with people. I have to help them. Because I do, I'm the same way to myself. And so for other people, I'm like, I know this is what you want to hear and you might hate me for this, but here it is. Cause I think it'll help you. I don't, I don't, it doesn't matter to me to hurt feelings. I know you'll get over it because I know we're both prioritizing growth. And so everything will be okay in the end. Holly says, so true. I love the thought process here. Thank you. Okay. I think we're good here. You guys, I am so happy with how day one has gone day two got to be even more fire. So I hope everybody will be here live as well. 4 p.m. tomorrow. I hope you guys had as much fun here as I have had because I've had an absolute freaking blast. Tomorrow and Wednesday, same time, same place. Hopefully Zoom won't give us as many problems tomorrow, but I'll see you then. The replay will be up in probably about half an hour.